Mmm, that's crisp. Not sponsored by Pepsi, not yet anyway. Hello everyone, my name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you're new here and you like this kind of content, I hope you'll consider subscribing. So I've owned this bike, the 2022 Aprilia Touareg 660 for about the past six months. The point of today's video is going to be number one, to give you what I feel are the brutally honest pros and cons to the Touareg. And then the second part of the video, the longest part is gonna be answering all the questions that you, my viewers, sent in. Now, I would highly recommend if you have any interest in this bike, watch my whole video series on the bike. So I've got it broken up into different episodes. I'll link, the, I'll link the playlist here below so you can access all those videos. Might be useful to watch them in order to kind of see all the information and tests that I've put, there, put out there about this bike. All right, now a couple housekeeping items really fast. I normally like to film outside, give you a little bit better lighting, a little bit better view, but the sun is just too bright in my eyes right now. It's the morning, it's when I can film, so uh, excuse me for doing it kind of in the garage with the weird lighting. Another thing is I'm gonna have to read off my little prompter here. Uh, excuse that, but obviously I'm reading off all these questions and there's no way for me to memorize that, so I need to read off this, so please pardon that. So let's start off with what I think are the brutally honest pros of the bike. I'm gonna kind of breeze through these quickly because a lot of these are gonna come up in the audience Q and A. Uh, number one, value for money. There's you get a lot for a lot out of this bike for the twelve or thirteen thousand dollars that it costs. A lot of features, a lot of content, really good quality components, and a lot of performance for the money. Number two for me is going to be the suspension performance, uh, especially off-road. This is some of the best adventure bike suspension that I've used. It's plush and comfortable, but it's also very supportive and has a really progressive feel as you start riding faster. It also has really good range of adjustment. Number three for me is going to be the off-road performance. This is one of the best off-road multi-cylinder adventure bikes you can purchase today in 2023. The off-road performance is simply exceptional on this bike, and I've tested just about every adventure bike out there. Next up for me is gonna be the engine. The engine is really a gem in this motorcycle. It sounds amazing, it makes very smooth, predictable linear power, it it's, uh, doesn't have any vibration, it has character, uh, the torque curve's very flat, just a great engine for an adventure motorcycle. Next up for me, the electronics. The electronics, the rider aids, whether it's a traction control, the ABS, all of it's integrated very well. It's very easy to use. It remembers the settings and it's not confusing. So I do like the way they implemented the electronics here. Another thing for me is a pro, the air filter on this bike is right up here on top of the gas tank, a little cover you pop off, you can get to the air filter. You can't say that about all adventure bikes and I ride in the dust quite a bit and I need to be able to get to my air filter. Next up for me, the ergonomics of the bike. The bike's comfortable for riding on the road, sitting down, but what really shines out for me is how good this bike is set up for standing up. The bars, the foot pegs, everything is in a good position. The bike feels slim between your legs. It's an easy bike to stand up on all day and ride off road. Next up for me as a pro is gonna be standard cruise control. I beat this like a dead horse in some of their videos. Why don't we get cruise control on more of these mid-sized motorcycles? It's an amazing feature when you're riding all day, when you're touring, when you're riding day after day to be able to rest your throttle hand, maintain a constant speed. Most of the bikes now already have ride by wire. So I don't see what my, why more bikes don't have the cruise control. Thank you Aprilia for giving us that on this bike. Next up as a pro for me is gonna be the fuel range and the miles per gallon. In some of the early videos, I commented that the uh, fuel economy wasn't quite as good as I was expecting. However, as the bike's gotten more miles on it and broken in, I've noticed that the fuel economy has gone up quite a bit. So I can get between 50 to 60 miles per gallon. We're gonna cover this in the Q&A part. But anyway, the fuel range and the fuel tank size you know, you can go between 200 to 250 miles. Uh, that's really nice compared to something like a Tenere 700 with that smaller fuel tank where you're limited to more around 150 miles. This has a nice fuel range. All right, so what are the downsides to the Touareg 660? It's not a very big list, but there are some that you need to know. Uh, the number one thing for me is gonna be that the engine does put out quite a bit of heat. I don't know if it's the exhaust, the catalytic converter, the engine, whatever it is, but what happens is you feel your legs are kind of warm. You start to notice it when it's above about 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and your legs feel warm. It's not overwhelming, it's not a deal breaker, but it is warmer than some other bikes, and it could be a factor for some of you. If you're riding in slower conditions around town, or you're riding in a lot of hot weather, you are gonna notice a little bit more engine heat out of this bike. Next up as a con is the dealer network. We've talked about this in the other videos in the series, but there are not many Aprilia dealers, at least here in the USA. Some states here in the USA have no Aprilia dealers. So uh, purchasing the bike, getting service, getting parts when you're on the road, that could potentially be an issue. It's not really a con for me because I have dealers in Southern California where I live. Also, I can get parts mailed to me within a couple days, so I don't really need the dealership that often, but your mileage may vary, just depends on your comfort level. Next up is a con for me. Uh, the gearbox can be a little notchy, a little clunky, and sometimes it doesn't wanna uh, find neutral, especially. I don't know if adding the quick shifter made this worse. Maybe it did, although that doesn't really make sense, but finding neutral can be a little, a little notchy, a little hard. Not a huge thing, but it is something that I've noticed. And the last con for me, and this is completely personal, only for me, and really has nothing to do with reality or logic or common sense, but the styling, I don't know why, but something to do with the proportions or the styling, I'm just not a fan of it. I don't really like the way it looks. And for me, when I own motorcycles, I want them to look good. I want them to look good to me and to have a reaction to it. This doesn't really do that. And so that's kind of a problem for me, but again, just totally personal, has nothing to do with really reality. All right, part two, let's delve into all the questions you send in. Now, keep in mind, I received somewhere between 150 to 200 separate questions. So please don't be offended if I don't get to your personal question. Also, a lot of the questions I received were kind of the same thing. And so I've kind of lumped those together here at the beginning into some general questions, and then I'll get into more specific ones. Um, if you really have a burning question that I don't get to, please put that in the comments below or send me a private message or send me an email and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. So with that said, let's jump in. So, okay, uh, a lot of questions about compared to the Tenere 700. A lot of people are wanting a direct comparison between this and the Tenere 700. I may produce a separate video to that effect. Let me break this down as simply as I can. From a performance standpoint, engine, chassis, suspension, electronics, handling, braking, uh, all of that, the Tuareg is superior to the Tenere 700 in every single performance aspect by quite a big margin. It just is. Now, from an ownership aspect, that's a different equation. For some people, reliability and durability and parts network and dealer network and those sorts of things are far more important to them than the outmost you know, performance they can get. So it just depends on where you fall on that scale. Aprilia is not Yamaha, it's an apples and oranges thing. If you're okay owning a smaller Italian, uh, you know, a, a, a motorcycle from a smaller Italian company with uh, not as much parts out there and reliability can be a little bit more of a question mark, then the Aprilia does give you better performance and better features and I think is a better value for money than the T7. If all you really care about is ultimate reliability and you're stacking a ton of miles on your bike, then just get the T7, it's a great bike. If I have to break down the main differences between this and the Tenere 700, I would say, number one, suspension is far superior on this bike to the Tenere 700. Handling is a lot better. This bike carries its weight lower. It feels lighter than a T7. It also has a lower seat height. It has more ground clearance. It has more suspension travel. Again, everything is just engineered better. You get tubeless wheels. You get cruise control. You get a TFT dash. You get rider aids. You get better wind protection. Uh, the seat's more comfortable. You get more fuel range uh, because the fuel tank's larger. Uh, just about every single aspect is better. I don't know how else to say it. So again, just weigh what's right for you. Um, but I think if, if, the, if you're looking at a T7, but you're willing to also look at a brand like Aprilia, this bike uh, should be very high on your list. All right, the next thing, I get a ton of questions about reliability. So it's very difficult for me to really talk about reliability uh, in these types of reviews I do. There's a few reasons for that. Number one, 
how do we measure motorcycle reliability? What data do we have? Do we have scientific, quantifiable data from a large number of people about the issues their bikes have? No, not really, and no one's really doing those studies. So it's really kind of dishonest uh, for people out there to say that one's more reliable than the other. Everyone goes off anecdotes and stories from their friends and things that they read online on forums and social media. That tends to warp the perspective of reality because people go to social media to complain when they have an issue or fix a problem that they have, not to say, oh, my bike is fine, uh, it's okay, and I'm not having any issues. So it's very difficult to figure this out. Now, on average, is a Yamaha or a Honda probably gonna have less issues in the long run over a lot of mileage than an Aprilia or a KTM or something like that? Yes, I think that is fair to say that's probably gonna be true. It's not true in every case, but it's probably true. So I know you're frustrated. You want me to give more of, a, of an answer yes or no on this. So this bike has been flawless in the six months I've had it. Because I've probably ridden 20 or 30 different bikes in the past six months because I test bikes for a living and make videos, I haven't been able to stack a ton of miles on this bike. It only has about 1,500 miles or about 2,500 kilometers. However, I am in the owners groups on Facebook and the forums and stuff like that. And despite the downsides to those that I said, I haven't seen any major issues. There was a couple people that had an oil leak from maybe the water pump gasket or something like that, or the oil pump gasket, but well, that was an easy fix. Um, one guy had his, the, the, the nut that holds the starter cable on, the electrical cable to the starter came loose and the bike wouldn't start, tightened the nut and to fix that. Minor things, I would say it seems to be reliable and Aprilia seems to have the engine sorted out uh, on this bike from some of the earlier 660 engines where they had a few issues years ago. So it seems reliable, but we just won't know until people can stack 50 or 100,000 miles on this bike. And this bike's only been out a year, so it's just too early to tell. I'm sorry, I just can't give you a better answer than that. All right, next up, I got a number of questions about, you know, lifting the bike, picking it up. So I do, did feature that in one of my videos, so go watch that episode. The bike's relatively easy to lift because it's got the lower center of gravity. It is easier than a Tenere 700. Um, it's, it's doable. Again, it's still a heavy adventure bike and it's tall, so you're going to have to be pretty strong and in pretty good shape to be able to lift it up. Um, it's not as hard as like a Tiger 1200 or an Africa Twin uh, or maybe a Desert X. Uh, it's not quite as easy as something like a KTM 790 or 890 Adventure with those low fuel tanks sticking out. So I'd say it's average and, um, you know, you're going to have to try it for yourself. But it weighs 450 pounds, so it's still a heavy bike. I got a lot of questions about vibrations. Do you have vibrations at higher speeds? So while the engine does turn at relatively high RPM, being a smaller motor, when you're going, you know, 70, 80, 90 miles an hour or like 140 kilometers an hour, yes, uh, the motor is spinning up there 6,000 RPM or higher. There's really not any vibrations that I can notice. Maybe a tiny bit of buzz to the foot pegs, very small, nothing really to the handlebar. It's a very smooth motor, so I didn't have any issues with that. What about servicing costs? A lot of people ask about, you know, service costs, dealership experience. So a lot of this is going to de depend on, do you have a good deal that you trust that are honest people that don't uh, sort of take advantage of you in terms of pricing? My dealer, uh, GP Motorcycles in San Diego is great. Seem to be really honest, fair pricing. Um, I haven't found service to really be any more expensive than other European bikes that I've owned. Uh, the, the most expensive part would probably be if you had that 12,000 mile valve adjustment, valve clearance adjustment, that could get a little pricey. But besides that, I mean, basic oil changes, resetting a service light, which you do have to do, which is kind of annoying. You have to go to the dealer to reset the service light on the dash, but that's true of Ducati. It's true of BMW. So, uh, yeah, uh, I did my own first service, the oil change. I try to do my own service when I can. I just prefer to work on my own, my own bike. So I didn't spend hardly any money. I just bought some oil and an oil filter, checked a few things over. Okay, I got a lot of questions about asking to compare this to a KTM 890 Adventure. So a couple things to keep in mind. A KTM 890 Adventure, whether you're looking at the base model or the arm model, is almost, uh, almost one little size up in, in terms of price, features, power, uh, weight, all those things. So. This is a bit more affordable, a bit smaller, a bit lighter, a bit more compact. The 890 Adventure, because KTM designed that bike from the ground up and was very innovative in their design with the low slung fuel tanks, the centralized weight, uh, the good suspension, the amazing chassis, it's really almost impossible to beat that, that platform for an adventure bike in terms of handling and weight distribution and things like that. I'm not going to say that this is better than that because it, it's not. If you want the ultimate in performance, 
and you're okay with KTM and some of the potential things that, that they have there, uh, the 890 is, is the one to get. Um, however, there's some things I do like better about this. I do find off-road, especially in loose terrain, the engine response from this is a bit smoother. The engine is a little bit um, less eager, or less aggressive on this. It's a little bit smoother power delivery. So I do kind of prefer this engine off-road. On the highway, the extra power, about 25 horsepower more on the 890 is very much welcome. Uh, the, the little bit sharper handling on the 890 on the highway. Um, the brakes on the 890 are a little bit stronger, although these are good. You know, uh, fuel range is a little better also on the KTM. The KTM is more crash worthy because it's got uh, protection built in. You don't have to add the weight of crash bars. You don't have to add handguards because it's got good handguards. You don't have to add the weight of a big skid plate because the skid plate's pretty good stock. So again, KTM is pretty unbeatable in terms of an adventure bike. I got some questions comparing it to the Desert X. That's kind of a weird comparison because bikes like the Desert X or maybe a Tiger 900 Rally Pro, those are about seventeen dollars to $18,000 and this is about $13,000. So yeah, that's like what, 40 or 50% more expensive. It's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison. With those bikes, you get more power, you get a bit more refinement for the highway, maybe some more wind protection, uh, some more features, um, you know, a little bit higher end components and some respects. If I'm going to compare directly to the Desert X, uh, the Desert X is a really, really good overall package. One of the best out there. The handling is incredible on and off road. Suspension's really good. Brakes are phenomenal. Uh, it looks amazing. It's really well made. Uh, it's got the nice power. It's got a smooth engine. Ducati's great, but ownership of the Ducati, I think, is a little bit troubling for me because I can't get to the air filter, got to remove the whole gas tank, which is the whole process. Dealer servicing can be expensive, and Ducati's not very supportive in terms of right to repair or getting service manuals for their bike. So for me, from an ownership perspective, Ducati's a little bit challenging for me, although I still would own a Desert X because I like it so much. Desert X is um, a little bit heavier, a little bit more top heavy. It's got the gas tank, which is a little bit fragile there for dents because it's the big metal gas tank. I think this is a bit more crash worthy, a bit more durable there, a bit, um, you know, better for, for rough terrain riding. So I don't know, that's a tough one. The Desert X is kind of in a size up. All right, let's get into some of the specific questions uh, that I got. So Meerkat ADV says, uh, what are the quirks of the bike? So it's a good question. Um, it is an Italian bike, so now and then you do run into something that's a quirk. Uh, the first thing that I found was I was out on a ride and I needed to tighten my chain tension. It had gotten too loose. The rear axle nut is a 26 millimeter wrench, which nobody has because almost no other bikes are 26. You see 24s, you see 27s, the KTMs, you might see a 32 mil. So I had those in my tool roll. I didn't have a 26, so that was a challenge. I, I ended up changing the axle nut, buying a different one to a 27 millimeter, uh, which uh, fixed that problem. That was the only real quirk that I found so far. Everything else is pretty normal. I mean, it, just because it's uh, Prilia doesn't mean there's anything really crazy. Everything kind of works as you, as you would expect. So there's less quirks than I thought. And besides that, I haven't really run across anything. Northern Fins and Feather said, is it worth it considering the small dealer network? So we've already kind of talked about that. I think it depends on where you live in the world and the type of riding you like to do. You just have to decide, is the lack of dealers in your area an issue for you or not? Are you comfortable ordering through the mail? Are you comfortable doing your own work to your bike like I am? Uh, so that depends. And if you're going to be stacking on a ton of miles doing a round the world trip, I'm not sure that I would choose an Aprilia. I'd probably choose, uh, you know, one of the big four Japanese brands or BMW, but that would just be me. Uh, now, uh, so Awesome Renee says, will doing mods void the warranty such as the catalytic converter delete and things like that? Um, yes, potentially doing any um, significant modifications to the exhaust, the emissions control systems, the engine, the intake, anything like that could void a warranty on any motorcycle. And people don't really realize that when they start doing some of these mods. So I'm always very questionable about some of the modifications people do. So don't always believe things you see on Facebook. Um, who cares if you get three more horsepower? That just doesn't matter. It's not gonna make any difference to anything. So uh, I would say don't do any modifications that really don't need to be done. The factory warranty is one year unless you bought an extended warranty. 
Okay, some more general questions I've got mixed in here. Compared to an Africa Twin, so everything I said about the comparisons to like the Desert X and the Tiger 900 would kind of apply to the same thing. The Africa Twin is a larger, heavier motorcycle. It's more top heavy. It's got some more features. It's got a little bit more torque from the engine, a little bit more power. Um, off-road, the Touareg will, will run circles around an Africa Twin for sure in terms of its agility, it's a smaller size, better suspension, it just feels much smaller. Uh, on the highway, the Africa Twin might have a little bit of an advantage with more displacement, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, more, more stable ride, a little bit better for carrying passengers and luggage. So you just have to decide how you're going to use your bike. Um, again, passengers, carrying a lot of luggage, doing extended highway miles, yeah, look at those larger bikes. For more 50-50 riding or a lot of off-road, I like the mid-sized bikes like this Touareg. Patriot USMC, thank you for your service by the way, he says, uh, is the kickstand mounting point fragile? So I just looked at it, in my opinion, no. It's kind of mounted to a tab off the, off the frame. It's not mounted to the engine. So it looks like it's really sturdy to me and I don't see any issues with that and I've not heard of any issues with that. Uh, some bikes out there, I think the Harley Pan America is one that I pointed out, has a kickstand that mounts to the engine case. And when I see that, I always cringe because that could be an issue, but that's not the case with this bike. Uh, Simon Stryker says, the valve adjustment difficulty. So on any of these parallel twin bikes where the engine's buried down underneath the airbox and the fuel tank, there's going to be a lot of disassembly involved in getting to the valve ad adjustment uh, procedure, to getting the cover off and getting into those valves. Then you're going to be dealing with cams uh, and shims and things like that. So unless you're a pretty advanced at-home mechanic and you're really comfortable with that kind of thing and you have a service manual, then I wouldn't be attempting it. 95% of people are going to need to go to a dealer or a service shop to have that done. Dave 911 says warranty. Uh, the warranty is one year, at least here in the U.S. You can buy extended warranties if you want. I never buy extended warranties personally because I don't believe in them, but that's just me. Engine heat. There's a lot of questions about the engine heat. I mentioned this in the first part of the video. Yes, the engine heat is uh, a real thing with this bike. It runs hotter than, or it feels hotter on your legs, I should say. It doesn't run hot. The temperature gauge never goes up, but it, it feels hotter on your legs than a lot of motorcycles. So keep that in mind. It could be an issue if you ride in a lot of slow situations around town or you live in a really hot climate. Beer Money Prop says this or a Husky FE501S for a daily commute and also BDR backcountry discovery route type riding. So for what you describe, this kind of bike or this category, in my opinion, is way better. You have much longer maintenance intervals than a uh, 501 or a KTM 500. The highway comfort is dramatically a universe difference. Uh, this doesn't vibrate. This can go high speeds without feeling strained. Um, again, you're, you're, it's an apples and oranges thing. The FE501 is uh, is a dirt bike with a license plate and turn signals. Uh, this is an adventure bike designed for long distance high speed travel with luggage and potentially passengers. So very different type of thing for what you describe, uh, especially for that when you said daily commute, this all day long over the 501. I love my dirt bikes and dual sports, but they're just very different. <clears throat> and I think for the back for the BDR type riding, this kind of bike is also perfect because you can punch out long highway miles, but it's still very good off road. Monza DH says wind buffeting. Yeah, there is some wind buffeting. On adventure bikes, the windshields are always too far away from the rider because of how the ergonomics work out and how the packaging of the bike works. So it does create some turbulence around the windshield. This bike has what I'd say average wind buffeting. Um, not as bad as some of the V-Stroms, not as bad as the Desert X, but it's not as good as like a BMW GS or a Tiger 900. It's not as smooth as those. So it's kind of average. Uh, the Pewege wind deflector, which I feature in my accessory video, does help a lot. So you can address it. I don't, it's not a deal breaker at all. I would say it's average wind buffeting. Um, some people are more sensitive to it depending on the helmets they wear, their hearing, whatever it is. Uh, so it just depends person to person. All right, awesome. Renee says, do you have any trouble finding neutral? Yes, I do. Uh, it's kind of annoying. And I think it got worse when I put the quick shifter on and I'm not sure why that is. Um, not a huge issue, but it is a little bit annoying. So yeah, I do notice that. Chadley Bishop says, is a dirt noob uh, or a new person to dirt, better off with a 660 or a 701 690? Oh, that is a really good question. So a couple things there. Number one, how tall are you? Because uh, the 701 690 is a pretty amazing platform, but it's a very tall seat height, like 35, 36 inches, compared to this bike at around 33, 34 inches. So the big difference there, unless you're really tall, you might be uncomfortable on a 690 or 701. Uh, this is a lot heavier. This is 100 pounds heavier than that bike. Um, 
you know, again, the 690 is almost like a big dual sport, and this is a small adventure bike. So wind protection, fuel range, high speed stability, high speed comfort, carrying luggage and passengers. You have to decide where you fall in all those areas. For a dirt noob, um, you know, a lighter bike is gonna be better. And I would answer and say that if you're new to the dirt, you should get a KLX 300 or CRF 250L or KLX 230 or a DRZ 400 if you're tall enough, something like that. I wouldn't get a 690 or I wouldn't get this bike if you're trying to learn to ride in the dirt. They're both too big, heavy, and powerful. Sick Day Adventure says, price notwithstanding, if you could only have one, would you get this or KTM 890 Adventure? Uh, for me, it would absolutely every day be the KTM 890 Adventure. Uh, as much as I love this bike, it just can't quite beat the KTM. The KTM is engineered in a superior way. The fuel tank design with the low saddle tanks, the lower center of gravity, the centralized mass, the crash worthiness, the durability, uh, the, the, the handling and the chassis performance, the suspension performance, the fuel range, the electronics with a nine level traction control, the rally mode. The KTM is built from scratch as a, a hardcore adventure bike uh, and, it, and it shows. KTM did their homework with that. So for me, I will accept uh, some, of the, some of the little issues now and then with KTM and go uh, with the higher performance and what I feel is a superior platform with the KTM. That's just me. It doesn't mean I don't love the Touareg. It's an incredible bike and it's right up there with the KTM. But if you're asking me, yeah, uh, I, I would have to choose the 890. And the extra power. I'm a power junkie. I like acceleration. And so the extra 25 horsepower is a lot of fun on the 890. Pan Sazafa says, can this replace my KTM 990 in terms of power, et cetera? Uh, not really. I mean, this is about 80 horsepower versus 100 to 110 horsepower you have in your 990. Smaller engine, so it's kind of an unfair comparison there. In terms of how you use the bike, if you're using it 50% off-road, 50% off on-road, yes, this does fulfill the same mission as your 990. Uh, but, um, and I think this handles better and is easier to ride and gets better fuel economy and feels lighter and is easier to service and all those things, I would rather have this. Uh, but if you like the power of your 990, I don't think you're quite going to be satisfied with the less power from this bike. Bill Five Forrester Guy says, is it a good value? Uh, yes, and I mentioned this earlier in the video. I think it's one of the best values for any adventure bike currently out there. Mike Hayes 77, this or Norden Expedition better in the dirt? Oh, that's just a good question. So I haven't ridden the Expedition yet, but I can kind of imagine what that's like because it has a WP Explorer uh, forks from the uh, KTM R model and it's got the Norden bodywork, but the, but the Norden is a KTM 890 underneath. It's the same bike. So, oh, that's a tough one. I think this is a little bit easier to ride. The power delivery is a little bit smoother and more progressive on the Touareg. The engine feels a little bit more tractable in loose conditions. This bike feels a little smaller and slimmer and, and, and just more compact to me than a Norden or an 890, but that's tough. They both perform, I would say, equally well, um, but this might be slightly easier and more gentle and approachable to ride, if that makes any sense. Burnett B says fuel economy. So I mentioned this before, but when the bike was new, I was getting around 45 to 50 miles per gallon. Uh, now I'm getting 55, I would say between 50 to 60 miles per gallon. So it's gone up. So it seems to be really, really good on this bike. Moto Tom Cambodia says long distance comfort and pillion comfort. So when I hear someone asking about long distance touring or riding with a passenger, that usually is a cue to me that they may want to look at, you know, those larger adventure bikes. These bikes are perfectly fine for that. Uh, and it is comfortable and it is good at high speeds and you can take a passenger. There's enough room for that. It can carry that, can hold luggage and it can sit at high speeds on the, on the motorway. But would a 1250GS or a Tiger 1200 or a Multistrada or a KTM 1290 be better for that use? Yes. So again, you're just going to have to put that all on the scale and see what's better for you. Swedbear says headlight performance. The headlight performance, I would say, is above average. You know, a lot of new motorcycles with the LED headlights have gotten pretty good. Motorcycles used to have terrible headlights in the past. All the modern ones, in my experience, have gotten pretty good. I would say the Touareg is above average, and I do really uh, like it. However, if I was riding at night frequently, I would definitely add some extra lights. 
Pavel Shorsk says, compared to an 890 Adventure base model, so we always kind of talk about the R model KTM, the base model 890 Adventure, um, yeah, that's that's a, an interesting one. The base 890 Adventure, some people call it the S model, which is not true, it's not called the S, it's just the, it's just the 890 Adventure, is a little bit more road oriented for sport touring or touring riding uh, than the R model KTM, is a little bit more road oriented than this. It's got less suspension travel, lower seat height, uh, more power, it's more more of that all roads touring bike or kind of lightweight sport tour uh, with, with good off-road ability. Um, the less suspension travel on the 890 base model means that it's much more taut, much sportier, and more aggressive on the road for twisty riding. Uh, it's better as a highway bike, and the power is way more. The electronics are better, the wind protection is better. Off-road, this is going to be quite a bit better because of the suspension mostly uh, than the 890 base model. Okay, Spadex says, is the engine as punchy as a Tenere 700? Yes, it is. It is as punchy. The difference is they both have really good power down low. The T7 might have like a tiny bit more low end torque. It's hard to say. This bike's pretty close. But then the difference is when you wind this engine out, this bike loves to be revved out to 10,000 RPM. I don't even think the T7 can do that. I think its red line is much lower. So this bike has more top end power, giving it the 80 horsepower versus like the 72 horsepower on the T7. So this engine is more flexible. It has a bit more power on the top end. They're both punchy down low. ADV Agenda says, how does it feel fully loaded with luggage? So it feels pretty good. Uh, it feels fine with luggage. I've used different luggage systems from the rackless bags to traditional panniers. Um, in general, the lighter weight motorcycles are more affected by luggage because if you think about it, the percentage of weight that you're adding is higher with your luggage on a smaller bike. So for instance, if you add 50 pounds of luggage to a 300 pound bike, you've you've changed the handling a lot more as a, as a ratio than you would adding 50 pounds of luggage to a 600 pound you know, BMW GS Adventure. So if that makes any sense, smaller bikes tend to be more affected by the weight of luggage than a larger bike would be. But that being said, uh, this thing's plenty sturdy. It has the hydraulic preload adjustment to crank that up when you add the luggage on the back. I think it's very good for carrying luggage. No issues with that. Truman Johnson says, I ride a KTM 890 base model due to the seat height. Is the 660 superior or just equivalent? So we've kind of already talked about uh, the 890 base model comparisons. Uh, the 660, is it superior or equivalent? Uh, Off-road, the Touareg is better. On the road, your 890 is a lot better. So it's a trade-off there with that. I would say if you're happy with your 890 and you're comfortable with the seat height, I wouldn't really change because this is a little bit taller than the uh, KTM 890 base model. Zoltan Zok says, is this the true jack of all trades middleweight adventure bike? Is it too good to be true? I think this is that jack of all trades bike. It, it's what we wanted from the Tenere 700, or it's what the Tenere 700 is in terms of a do everything bike. Not too big, not too small, has good power, but you get the added features like the cruise control, better electronics, better fuel range, better suspension, and all of that. So I think it is kind of that getting close to that unicorn mid sized bike. That's why I bought it and tested it, and I love it for, for that reason. Dale T says, is the high compression engine an issue if you're using low octane gas when traveling? Um, I have not tested putting an 87 octane in the bike. I think it would adjust and be okay. Most modern vehicles and motorcycles, when you put in lower octane, there's a knock sensor in there that can adjust things a little bit to make that okay. Uh, so I, th I think it would be okay, but I can't verify that. And Aprilia does recommend the higher octane. Uh, but again, uh, further testing would be needed. If there's anybody out there who can give a better answer, then please chime in. Rebel Canuck says, is this the closest to the unicorn? Um, now, unicorns don't exist, and a unicorn bike's never going to exist. I've, I've, I always say that. But yeah, I would say this is about as close as it gets. Dumbledoof says, first time rider friendly. Uh, potentially, if you're big and strong and tall, then yeah, I think it could be. But for most first time riders, I'd recommend a smaller, lighter weight, more affordable bike than this. Chris York says, any recalls? Uh, nope, I haven't seen any recalls come out yet. ADV Australia says, is this worth two, two and a half KLR 650s? I think if we do our math, it's actually about two KLR 650s. A KLR is about seven grand. This is about 13. So yeah, it's about two KLRs. Um, it is for me, uh, it is for a lot of people. 
Um, it just depends what you value. If you just want to ride somewhere and you don't really care about high performance, then no, it's not worth twice two or two KLRs. Uh, but if you if you want to have more fun, if you want to go faster, you like nicer stuff, then then yeah, it's worth two KLRs for sure. It's definitely twice as good of a bike. Um, but if you had a limited budget and you were trying to buy motorcycles for you and your spouse to like do a trips with, I'd just buy two KLRs and have a great time. Uh, TR says, compared to a KTM 690 on and off-road, yeah, that's a good question. So off-road, there's no denying physics. I mean, the 690 is 100 pounds lighter. The suspension, I'd say, is pretty equivalent. Uh, the 690 suspension is decent, but I don't think it's better than this. Uh, this is a lot heavier, bigger, obviously. So off-road, the KTM is always going to take the win. On the road, though, this blows the KTM out of the water completely and is a much better, more suitable bike for long-distance riding. So you just have to choose where you, where you fit on that spectrum. Okay, that's it for the questions. Um, I know I missed some. Please put them down below or send me an email if you have a burning question. I'm sorry I couldn't get to everything, but that's all the ones that I picked out from Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So thank you for sending those in. Again, please don't miss my other videos on this bike. I'll link the playlist below. Uh, other than that, uh, please support Big Rock Moto. There's ways to do that in the description below and in a pinned comment. Please ride safe, and I'll see you out there.